and welcome back to the Wellness Paradox podcast. I'm so grateful that you can join us on this journey towards greater human flourishing. As always, I'm your host, Michael Stack, an exercise physiologist by training and a health entrepreneur and a health educator by trade. And I'm fascinated by a phenomenon I call the wellness paradox. That is the disconnect between our medical community and our fitness and wellness professional community. This podcast is all about closing off that disconnect by disseminating the latest, most evidence-based, and most engaging information in fitness and wellness sciences. For episode 15 today, I'm joined by two very close and near and dear friends, Devin Tarrant and Nate Langley. Both of these individuals have worked with me for over the past decade as we've gone through the trials and tribulations of trying to grow a commercial fitness business. The reason I'm so excited about this discussion with Devin and Nate is because it's really focusing around human development. So often, those of us who are in an industry as professionals and practitioners and clinicians like the fitness and wellness industry, we spend much of our time focusing on our technical development, but considerably less time focusing on our personal development as humans. We do that as individuals, but we also do that as leaders and managers, where we teach our team a bunch of technical and tactical skills, but sometimes ignore the very human aspects of development. And that's what this conversation is, is really around. In fact, it's largely around the mistakes that we've made in trying to sustain the growth of a business for over the past decade and a half almost in the highly competitive boutique commercial fitness industry. So I think this is going to be a little bit of a different discussion for everyone, but I think it's going to be one that's going to resonate with everyone quite a bit. If you're a, a business owner or operator of a fitness or a wellness business, probably any business for that matter, but certainly fitness or wellness, I think you're going to hear some of our pain points and our struggles with employee development over time and some of the things that we've learned, and hopefully you can learn from those too. But more importantly, we're really going to dive into and unpack aspects of personal development. And Devin and Nate have incredibly deep perspectives on this. They are, they are very deep, critical thinkers. And I think you're going to find their perspectives refreshing and also resonant at the same time. So I really hope you enjoy this conversation. Again, it's less technical. It's a little bit more philosophical. But even in being philosophical, it is highly, highly practical. As always, the show notes for this episode can be found on the Wellness Paradox website at wellnessparadoxpod.com forward slash episode 15. I hope you enjoy this conversation with Nate and Devin. I am very excited for today's conversation. We're gonna dive into a discussion around personal and professional development. And when I thought of who to do this podcast with, I couldn't think of two better people to have this conversation with because these are two people who've been in the trenches with me for over the past decade at the fitness center that we have built over the course of time. And, and we won't explain too much of the, the history of Applied Fitness Solutions, which is the, the company I founded, but I think it's important to know that we were founded in 2007, kind of at the start of the boutique boom in the fitness industry. And we saw some success. We've had a lot of success and we've certainly had a lot of failures over time. I hope more successes than failures, but today we're, we're here to really talk about the successes and failures we've had around personal and professional development, both for ourselves as individuals and for our teams that we have led over the course of the years. And if you're listening to this and you run a fitness or a wellness center and you have a staff that's between the ages of 20 and 30 years old, like the vast majority of our staffs are in the industry, I think this discussion is really going to resonate with you. And I want to start out by just allowing our guests today to introduce themselves. Um, Nate, I'll start with you. Nate's been on an episode of the podcast before. Nate, Nate was on episode 13 of the podcast where he helped kind of walk through the transition. So Nate, why don't you just introduce yourself to our audience? Yes, sure. Good to be back. Um, Nate Langley, silly human, turned that odd quality into a career somehow with Mike back in, uh, I think 2011 is when I started with Applied Fitness. 
Um, a lot of my, I guess you could call it career. I'm not a big title guy, as you can already probably tell. A lot of my career has been focused on storytelling, marketing, messaging, communication. So um, I come at this from the angle of how we relate to ourselves and other people. So that'll probably be the perspective I try and add to the conversation and been working with these two happily for over 10 years. Yeah, we often we often call Nate our chief storyteller at AFS, and he is really passionate about helping people discover themselves on a deeper level and not just become better professionals, but as we're going to talk about today, become better humans. And, and, and Devin is, is very similar in that respect. Dev, this is your first time on The Wellness Paradox. So welcome. Why don't you introduce yourself to our audience? Yep. Thank you, man. Uh, Devin Tarrant. I've been working with Mike since 2010. Um, I think I told him in our very first phone conversation ever that my dream was to own a gym. Uh, that was a dream of mine since like seventh grade. Um, and now I'm a co-owner with Mike here at our Plymouth location, um, in Plymouth, Michigan. So that's been really exciting, but it's been an interesting um, self-discovery ride, I would say, in terms of the reasons why I wanted to own a gym when I was younger. And then what I discovered about myself and the industry and just what, you know, people need to grow along the way. And that's why I'm excited to have this conversation because what I thought I wanted and what I thought people needed has been just drastically changed, you know, in, in the last 10 years of my life. And so it's all good stuff. I wouldn't trade the experience for the world. And I'm just excited to have this conversation with you guys. Awesome, Dev. And, and Dev and Nate are, are two of the more deep thinkers that I know. They, they've spent a lot of time thinking about and actually implementing some of the things that we're going to talk about today. And it's, it's interesting when we look back historically over the past you know, 12, 13 years of our business, most of which Nate and Devin have been involved with, uh, I think what we expected to happen and what actually happened were two very different things. There's, there's two quotes that come to mind. First quote is, no plan survives first contact with the enemy, which I like. But my favorite quote in this type of a situation is everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face, which that's a famous Mike Tyson quote. And I think when we all got into this, we all had a plan for how it was going to go and what we were going to do. And just the world punched us in the face. And fortunately, we've been pretty good at taking punches. And I think if anyone stayed in the industry for long enough, they have been. And I think one of the areas that we've had to really reframe our thought process around is how we develop our people. Everyone who's listening to this knows that you're only as good as the people on your team. Uh, we, we are in a customer service centric industry. Uh, we are in an industry that is greatly dependent on the human beings who interact with our customers and our clients. And so if you're listening to this and you're a facility owner and operator, the question becomes, well, how do you effectively develop the humans that you have on your team to run a, a profitable and impactful business. But also if you're listening to this and you're a fitness professional or a wellness professional, the question becomes, how do you better develop yourself? If you're the average fitness or wellness professional, you might be 24, 25, 26 years old, trying to relate to people in their forties and their fifties and their sixties. And that's a challenge. So this conversation is going to be around professional development. But I think as both the guys are going to talk about this personal and professional development become very intrinsically tied together so much so that they're, you almost can't separate them. So when we talk about this, we're going to talk about it from the perspective of the leader that's trying to develop their team, but also from the individual's perspective and how they're trying to develop themselves. And we're going to kind of bounce back and forth between those two perspectives and our goal here is just to share our pain points, our discoveries, and our failures over the past decade and a half with employee development. And we hope that through hearing our shortcomings and hearing our discoveries, we can save you a little pain and, and maybe shortcut some of your efforts. But I want to dive into this because there's, there's so much that we can talk about here. And guys, I want to start on a personal level. And Dev, I'm going to start with you because you've been an operational manager of a facility. So I think you've had more interaction with the professional development of your team. When you look back on the past decade or so, and certainly the past six years, seven, six or seven years since we opened AFS Plymouth, uh, where, did, where did we get it 
Right. Let's try to start from a positive perspective first about where we feel looking back on things from where we're at right now. Where did we get it right in terms of professionally developing our team? Um, I think there's quite a few places where we got it right. I wouldn't say that we got it wrong necessarily way more than we got it right. I think that there's layers to all of it, honestly, if you think about it. And so we'll probably dig into some of those layers. But um, our intention was always right. I really, truly believe that in my heart that we were never um, trying to maximize profit. We were never trying to, you know, grab a buck or, um, I don't know. It was it, our motivations in terms of why we were doing everything and how we were developing our people were always right. And that's, that's why I'm not ashamed of any of the failures, quote unquote, that we do have, because our intention behind it was always good. It was always based in good, solid morals and values. I felt like after we developed our core values and our mission statement and our um, vision, we really did stick to that. Um, so we definitely got it right in all of those areas. I believe, you know, um, we got it right. I think, to a certain extent in our hiring process and how we hired people. Um, maybe not right from the very, very beginning, but a couple of years in, we did recognize some flaws in how we were hiring people and we made some changes to that and in our interview process and what we were looking for in employees. So I think we got that right, more right than wrong. Um, and I think the, uh, the amount of time and effort that we do put into our team and personal development has been right. I think the content that we were delivering to them was more wrong, but the effort and the time and, and the energy and the money that we've spent on personal development, trying to get these people um, to be the best people and humans they can be for the world has been the right intention. I just don't think we went about that the right way all the time. So those are probably some of the areas I think we did well in. Yeah. And the, that intention part is important. And, and I do feel like a lot of people in our field have the intention to try to develop their team. We're kind of inherently an industry that tries to make people better when they come in contact with us. But just because you have the intention to do something doesn't necessarily mean that you do it well. And, and we'll dive into some of our struggles. Before I, I toss it to Nate to get his perspective on that, you mentioned something that is important that I, I'd like to hear you just unpack a little bit more. You talked about once we developed our mission, our vision, our values. And I think that was a significant inflection point for us. And I think a lot of times those are looked at as just literally the writing on the wall. Like, oh yeah, that's our mission, our vision, our values. Uh, that's not what those things are at AFS. And they actually serve a purpose. And I think they can for business owners and operators that are listening. Just talk on that for a second for our listeners to understand the importance of those things. Yeah, I think uh, a lot of companies there's a lot of people that start a new job and their first, their first uh, assignment from their boss is to go memorize those things and then repeat it back to them within seven days or something. And um, we've never really done that. I, I actually wouldn't say that anyone on our team could tell us word for word what those things are. And that's okay, because what more importantly, it's the people who um, are making these decisions about the company and the directions we're going I always look at those and reread them at least once a week. They're right up on our wall. And I just make sure that are we deviating from this? And I feel like in the you know seven years that we've had them or six years that we've had them up on the wall, I can honestly say that we're not deviating from what we said we wanted to do. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question, but that that's kind of where I, my mind went with that. Yeah, and I think you bring up a good point. You don't necessarily have to memorize these things, but they are things that provide us direction. They're like a compass for us. They drive our hiring process. What I think is really important to realize, and Dev, you alluded to it earlier, that we didn't initially get hiring right. There was a time where we weren't, we were swinging and missing more often than not with hiring. And we realized that it wasn't the technical skills that people possess that mattered for our environment. It was, do they fit into our culture and the, do they align with our values? And it was when we refined our interview process to start to consider our core values that I think we got much better at hiring. And I, and I don't want to make this toot on our own horn by any stretch of the imagination, but the most common compliment that I receive, and I think you probably receive as a business owner, is that you are so lucky. You hire such great people. And whenever somebody says that to me, I always say, well, I appreciate you saying that, but luck doesn't really have anything to do with it. Luck is not a good thing to operate a business off of. We have an intentional hiring process around our values. And, and for the business owner and operator that's listening out there, technical skill is a dime a dozen. 
you could teach anyone to do anything, but finding the right people is a challenge. And the right people for your business will be different than the right people for our business. And that's fine. You just have to identify who those people are. Yeah. Yeah. We did back in the day. I do remember you giving the basic skills exam and then doing like a on the floor training audition, which people were just really nervous for. I remember doing those things myself. And uh, I mean, it gave us some information, but as soon as we switched our interview and hiring process to the core values, the mission, and the vision, and um, all of our questions in that interview were rooted in that. It gave us a much better foundation in which to stand on. And we did see in our improvements drastically from that point on. Yeah, we, we saw who the human beings were in front of us. Yep. Nate, let, let me throw it over to you. In your role as kind of chief storyteller, chief marketing officer, you have less direct contact with employees and, and you're doing other things, but still you're involved in development work. Where do you feel like we got it right. Again, starting from the positive perspective. Yeah, I think uh, well, a, lot of, a lot of things Devin said resonated with me a ton, obviously. Uh, I think that we, we got it the most right where we could never have afforded to get it wrong, which is basing our entire experience around humans. <laughs> so if you're sitting here listening to this and you have a service-based product, whether you're a movie theater, a car wash, a personal trainer, whatever it is, if you have a service-based business, you should be prioritizing humanity. And I think that's the thing that we did really, really well is understanding that at the end of the day, that's, that's all we have is each other and finding those meanings, like you guys said, with the core values, the mission, the vision, and when you can start to create a shared meaning around an action or a set of actions that a lot of humans can take part in, you're going to start a movement. And that, that's what I think we were very successful at is People saw the way that we acted and the, the things that meant a lot to us and it resonated with them, right? And then slowly over time, from afar, people start to see these things they see on social media, they hear from their friends, they hear from people who are working there. Wow, that's the way they do the things there. Wow, that's what they care about. You're just going to attract the right kind of people, but it takes a lot of time to put all those building blocks together. So, and we're still building them. Yeah. And Nate, and in all honesty, you know, when, you, when you talk about that in terms of people seeing what we're all about. One thing that strikes me in advertising, and I know this is going to resonate with you because this is where you've spent the probably the most challenging parts of your experience in the industry, is that everyone is pretty much saying the same thing, right? Like from an offering perspective. And I'll, I'll give you a great example, then I'll let you riff on this for a second. You, and you may remember this, you read something to me and the rest of our leadership team once and I said, Nate, that's amazing. When, when did you write that about us? And you said, I didn't. I just read it off of Orange Theory's website. And it, it, was, <laughs> it, it, was, it was exactly, it sounded exactly like our business. And I thought, man, alive. Well, and Orange Theory does some great things. And they have a massively loud megaphone. And I'm like, how can we ever compete with the exact same messaging with a louder megaphone? And it's, it's what you said. It's people get to see what you're about. So it sounds like what you're saying is the true differentiator in your fitness or your wellness business isn't the way you do your exercise classes or the way you take body fat or coach nutrition. It's how you interact with other humans. Speak to that for a second. Um, a saying I like to use with our teams and the sort of the hope that I have for each of us as individuals while we move about the earth is leave a mark. Meaning, you know, if you're going to, if you're going to be interacting with someone, whether you're serving a transaction or you're, 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 you're on the receiving end of the transaction throughout your life, leave a mark on other people. Do it in a way where they felt something. Because again, those feelings have meanings to us and those meanings drive actions. So I think the funny thing about that, I do remember doing that. And it was, you know, all of us are saying all of these commoditized services are available and you can come and you can move this much and this many calories will be burned. And we have this machine, that machine. You have to boil it all the way down to those feelings. And this is something I've learned a lot from Devin and we've talked extensively about is we humans run around out there. That's all we're doing is chasing a feeling or running from a feeling, right? So if you can understand that and you can start your communication from that level, people immediately recognize it. They're like, oh, that's actually like the reaction you'll get. Well, oh, it, it kind of surprises them because they expect you to hit them with a two week free offer. You know what I mean? That's not going to sustain anyone's actions. I don't really even want someone, if I put an offer together that says something along those lines where it's like, hey, you got to make sure you give a, a, um, a sexy enough offer to get people to take action. That's not the person I want. 
because they're, they're, they're not operating from that deep level of feeling. They're operating on that transactional level. And I'm not going to have the opportunity to penetrate that and get deeper with them and actually help them make these really, really hard changes within themselves. I need the person who's been watching our stuff for a year and a half who already innately trusts us, who finally has that last little piece of pain that puts them over the edge and they go, oh, I'm actually going to do this. And they don't need an offer at that point. Those are the people that we're trying to you know, find out there and touch. Yeah. And the one thing I want to bring up here, and I think this is really important, is you're obviously a, a very talented marketing professional. You've been doing this for a while. But I don't suspect what you're saying here that people need to do requires that you have a strong professional background in marketing and brand strategy and things like that. It seems like what you're talking about is, is much more fundamental than that. I, uh, you, well, Mike, you can attest to this because we have these meetings every week. I'm very averse to doing formal marketing <laughs> because I know it doesn't mean much. So it's like, well, if you're a business owner out there, you're running your own personal training business or whatever it is, and you're trying to figure out how do I spend my resources? I've got, I got time, I got money and I got thought energy, right? Well, these humans that are, that are working under you and that you're trying to bring up, those ones, they're a wild card, you know, because if you get the wrong one in there, they can be a negative, but they have the most potential to create the highest upside for your organization. So if more companies spent more time developing their people to where their people provided a level of service that made people go, whoa, see, that's word of mouth. That's, that's what's actually going to drive your business forward. Whereas a lot of these other things that we do out there with even pay-per-click or, or social media as all that stuff, it just gets lost in the noise. Yeah. Yeah. So basically what you're saying is, is this is just the, the genuine commitment to try to make the people that are working with you and for you better human beings. And as a result of that, the, the knock-on effect of that is you have more positive business outcomes. I think you'll know if you're doing a good job, if people keep coming through your doors via referral, and you're not trying to get them to do that. All you're doing is serving your members. And I think that's when we've had our greatest successes, you know, early on in our organization is even when I came on, I was one of the big um, exciting factors in making the decision to move all the way down to Ann Arbor with you guys was uh, my cousin Jared was working alongside Devin and Mike at the time. And he said, yeah, we're, we're growing exponentially and we don't do a lick of advertising. I was like, well, how are people finding it? He's, he's like, I, we have people who are referring two or three people every single week to us. And it was because of the people that they interacted with at this place. That's all it was. Yeah. And we were very successful in that initially, but then we definitely got away from that and we definitely learned some pain in the process. And, and Dev, I'll, I'll flip it back to you to, to talk about maybe where we got it wrong, not necessarily from a, a marketing perspective, because that's not what you would speak to, but in terms of developing our team and, and our employees, where did we miss the mark, even though we had the right intentions? I think early on when people came in, we hit them really, really hard with uh, how can we make them the best possible personal trainer and fitness person, you know, which is an important part of any training. If you're going to be serving people fitness, you know, I'm not saying that's not important, um, but we didn't take into account and have the conversations with that employee about, okay, this is what you're doing now. Is this a career thing for you? Is this a two-year thing? Is this a five-year thing? Where do you want to be? How can we help get you pointed in the direction you want in life and develop skills? Because what we have here is a toolbox. It's a gym and we can offer fitness and personal training and nutrition coaching. And you can develop all these relationships. We're going to use this toolbox to serve our members, but how can we as managers serve you in terms of getting you on the path you want in life in general? We didn't really do that or have those conversations. We just tried to make them the most technically sound personal trainer we possibly could. And we weren't even paying attention. If someone wasn't passionate about it, we just forced it down their throat anyway, you know, and that was just the wrong way because um, it's really hard to give a good experience if you're dreading your, your four hours on the floor coming up. And I think we did that to people by trying to make them so technically sound it almost made them feel deficient compared to other trainers and gave them a self-confidence issue and then made them not really enjoy their job. Whereas if we make the uh, journey more, the constant improvement of your character, it's just a more attractive thing that's more beneficial. It doesn't just cover one base of personal trainer. It makes you a better human to move on to that next thing in the world. So I think we got that wrong um, to a certain extent with just how we were looking at their development when they came in. And then in terms of like marketing, 
what we did a really bad job on, I think, or not even a bad job. We were just so in the business. Our eyes were on the ground. Like our business was the only one in this little box. We weren't paying close attention to what was happening um, in the world. So we had that boutique boom where the industry was growing literally around 300% year on year where we used to have, you know, five or six gyms around us within a couple square miles. And all of a sudden after five years, we had 20 or 30. Like that's not even, that's not a fake number or an exaggeration. That's really true. There's 20 to 30 gyms within two square miles of me that offer circuit training, for example. That in 2012 was like five or six, you know? So our leads were naturally kind of going down. And since we hadn't reflected, like Nate said, you know, we were just serving people well, we weren't doing a ton of marketing. When leads started to dwindle, we just assumed um, maybe it's a marketing thing. And we started putting more and more into marketing, trying to drive people in that way. And we didn't take the personal responsibility to pause and ask ourselves, like, is our service, is the quality of our service what it once was? Because as we expanded from one location to two to three, I do think 100% our service fell off a little bit for a while. I think it's getting back to where it used to be for sure. I think we're on the right trajectory. But for a couple of years there with the growing pains and all of us just trying to keep our heads above water, we looked at our leads as a marketing issue rather than a service issue. And now in retrospect, when I look back, I'm like, our service was definitely falling off. So people weren't telling their friends as much as well as the marketing thing happening because you know there's 20 gyms marketing services rather than five. So it was a combination, but we can't really affect the growth of the industry, but we can affect the service we're giving our clients. So um, just taking personal responsibility for the service we were giving is something we kind of missed. We assumed it, we assumed that was staying constant and our marketing was failing when I don't think that was the truth. And now we know that looking back. Um, so those are the two things I think we missed pretty hard up front. Yeah, I think that desire to develop people technically is very common in our industry and you know, give them technical skills, give them technical skills. And let's be honest, everyone's giving roughly the same technical skills within you know five degrees, you know, one direction or the other. You said three things, though, that I suspect we're going to come back to when we get to the latter part of this discussion, which is talking about personal development. Now, you talked about personal responsibility. You talked about reflection and you talked about character and no need to speak on those any further right now. I think we can pin those and we can come back to them because knowing the conversations we had over time, I think those are three very strong pillars that you talk about quite a bit uh, when you're not only developing yourself as a person, but, but also our team. So I, I think that that's a, that, that's a, will be a good jumping off point. Nate, let me, let me shift to you uh, from your perspective. And I think you're going to agree with Dev on some of those things, but where do you feel like we swung and missed? Yeah, I, sitting here reflecting with you guys back on this stuff, it's it's crazy to think about how in the moment we were, you know, and this is just how life goes. You know, you learn from pain. I'm so happy that we had all these pains. Like, we didn't really talk much about what these pains led to, but, you know, anyone listening, I'm sure you won't be surprised. Financial pain. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's a lot of that. And uh, scaling is, it comes to my mind. Um, so like, you know, how did, how did you guys, a place who values so much this human interaction, how did you let that thing start to slip? And I think this, the scaling conversation is an important one because it, I think it happens to a lot of small to medium sized service providers and businesses. When you go to scale, you're trying to figure out, you know, all my different cogs of the wheel and how they all work and how, okay, so this is my fixed cost on this. And this is what my P and L's are going to say. And this is how much this is going to cost. Here's how much rent is. Here's how much employees are. We're just trying to get everything plugged in where there's a math problem that makes sense for going to another location and implementing, right? Well, there's really one big variable in there that's just not fixed at all. And that is the people. So you have to constantly, this is the biggest lesson I learned. I know it's almost shadowing what Devin said, but the people is a constant upkeep daily by moment, by the second, making sure that shared meaning stays strong, making sure, again, the thing that we got wrong, like he said, is we wanted to make sure that they were doing the transactional part right so that we could have it out of our minds as leaders. Well, you know, this is how you cue a squat or whatever it is. You know what I mean? All that technical stuff. Whereas it's like, if we would have prioritized the human underneath the trainer, we would have been doing less work over time to technically develop our people because they would have been self-driving their development. And that's a huge piece of this whole conversation we're having is if you as a leader can prioritize the humanity in, in your employee and try to help them get to the best version of themselves as a whole person, 
they're naturally going to do a better job for you because of those three principles that you, that Devin was talking about, like wholeheartedly going into the actions that they're taking and taking responsibility and ownership, but it's hard. <laughs> it's, it's a, it's hard to have the conversations and it's something that we, we continue to struggle with, I would say, even though we prioritize it. Yeah. And one thing that is interesting, and, and I hear it in both what you and Devin are saying, but we fully realize at AFS, fully and consciously realize that most people are not going to stay with us forever. Most people are not lifers. In fact, the very few people in our industry are lifers. Hopefully over time with podcasts like this and an effort to make you know, exercise more part of the, the healthcare continuum, uh, we can have more lifers in our industry. But I think, Nate, that our approach has always been that we just don't want to make you great for our environment. Our perspective has always been we want to make you as great as you can be here to turn out a great human to the world. And I think that perspective has been very helpful in allowing us to be willing to put in the time to those people. Because if someone's only with you for two years, you start to say, all right, well, what's the point of me putting all this time into them? But if your perspective shifts to making them a better human for the world, I think that that changes the calculus. Oh, it absolutely does. And it's the... <laughs> We were all going on this journey independently. We each have places we're going to try to get to. And there's, there's obviously different, you know, um, meanings that we're chasing. Maybe some of us don't even know what those meanings are yet. You know, some of us are lost moving around that's okay too. But if you are focusing on that self-development and helping people create standards for themselves, even if this doesn't end up being their thing, they're going, you're going to get more out of it, obviously as the business owner, but they're going to get more out of it too, because anyone that interacts with them and sees the kind of person that they're becoming that's infectious and it's going to stick with them and that could lead to opportunities for them later but what i talk to our team about all the time is if you are wholeheartedly pursuing all the things that you do in your life that's going to lead you to be 10 times more likely to find the one thing that means the most to you that's going to help you maximize your potential on earth right so it's like how do i get more opportunities well do everything to the best of my ability I'll get better. So I'm going to get more opportunities there and more people are going to see that and give me more opportunities because they want to help me along the, along the way. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, it's, it's interesting because fitness and wellness industry can only compensate so much money. This is a conversation that we have, you know, at nauseum is you know, how do we, how do we compensate our people more? And we want to compensate them more, but there's, this isn't technology. We don't have 80% profit margins and things like that. And I think one thing that you can compensate people with, if you can articulate it and commit to it, is that, that personal development. I think there are a lot of people that have worked for us for a very long time, maybe you know, both of you included, that it's less about the money and more about how they're growing as a human. And I think that is a real tangible benefit that, that you can offer people. I want to switch gears now because we're, we're, we've kind of talked about the benefits from an organizational perspective. And we've said, okay, you know, here's, here's where we got things right. Here's how we got things wrong. We, cer we certainly didn't cover everything. I feel like we've analyzed the things we've got wrong at such great length that we could probably do one of these for eight hours and we wouldn't necessarily hit everything. But I want to shift to the, the personal and development level here. And less from the business owner's perspective and more from the individual who's listening to it. And Dev, I'll throw it to you first, because I think the easiest way to start this part of the conversation is all three of us have gone on our own personal development journey, and there's been iterations of it for all of us. So I guess for starters, Dev, I'd be curious for you just to talk about what you've discovered on your own personal development journey, and then maybe try to relate that if you can to what others could discover about their own journey. Yeah. Uh, I guess first I'll say I used to feel ashamed almost of how I used to act or be or think, you know, um, as I grew and I would encourage anyone first before I even start this, uh, don't be ashamed of how you used to be. Be grateful for the fact that you're discovering new things about yourself and now you can be better in the future. You know, and I always think about, like a little kid that might have a, a bad behavior when the parent sees the kid actually not do that behavior and do something better. They don't ream the kid and say, yeah, see, you used to be an idiot. You shouldn't be doing that thing. You know, that's how it should be. They celebrate that and they say, good job. That's how it should be done. Great, great work. And you make the kid feel good about that. We don't do that with ourselves. So 
I would just encourage anyone on this personal growth journey to be grateful when you feel shame for a second, because you feel that shame because you recognize something about yourself that you didn't notice before. Um, and that's what I kind of started to realize is I was always trying to learn something new. Okay. My deficiencies are because I have a lack of knowledge in this area. And I would read this book or listen to this podcast and journal on this and journal on that and try to, you know, talk to new people, talk to both of you. We've had so many deep conversations on a lot of things, but what started to reveal itself to me around, I don't know, 28, 29 years old was, dude, it's not, you're not being held back on your personal development because of things you don't know. It's things that you already know that you're not doing. And you know that, you know? And so like that realization for myself was like a slap in the face and like it's true dude like I have an inner voice that tells me things I should and shouldn't do you know and you can get better at developing a relationship with that inner voice that tells you you know you shouldn't be doing this thing you know you could better spend your time on that and it's like but then right away our ego that duality inside of us comes up and starts to argue like yeah but it's okay because of this or you know other people are doing it no one will notice and it's like whoa like, maybe I don't need to learn anything new. Maybe I just need to start paying attention to that deeper part of myself that's guiding me because usually it's right, you know? So I guess in terms of helping other people develop, it's they, when I sit down and I ask them, like, what do you want out of life, you know? And they tell me and I say, okay, well, why aren't you doing that? And they'll tell me all the reasons why they're, they're not able to. And then my next question will be, well, are you doing everything possible in your control to take one closer step towards that thing you say you want? And almost 99% of the time it's, well, no, I'm not doing everything possible. It's okay. Well, let's make a list of those things. And that inner voice will tell them like, you don't know much about this. So you need to learn more about that. You know, you don't like getting up early in the morning, but you know, to make the extra time, you have to get up a little bit earlier. You know, you should probably go to bed a little bit sooner. You should probably clean up your diet. You should probably make sure you're getting your exercise. And like within 30 seconds, there's a list of 10 things that person could work on that they know they can work on but they they're not listening to that voice they're they're just saying oh that stuff's not that important i'll go and learn you know it's because of this thing over here and it's like just pointing out to people that you already know what you need to do you're just not being honest with yourself and that's a hard conversation to have because our egos get defensive quick because we don't want people to know that we're not doing what we're supposed to be doing and as soon as you do point that out to someone and they realize it you don't know if you're going to get someone that's grateful for that or if they want to punch you in the face, <laughs> you know, like you have no idea how that's going to go. Um, but I think that was a huge discovery for myself was it's not a lack of knowledge. Sometimes it is a lack of knowledge, but not all the time. And I was always trying to learn more rather than just do the things I already know I should do. So it's been a huge goal of mine to just gently and, you know, kindly point that out to people and help them come up with some sort of development plan to just be honest with yourself first. And then the answers to the questions you have will start to reveal themselves to you. That's great. And one thing you talk about a lot, and I'm always fascinated by this because it's something that inherently I don't do all that well, but you talk about the ability to shift your perspective and how important that is from a developmental standpoint. Talk, talk on that for a second. What, what, do you, what do you mean by that? And how is that beneficial? Yeah, it kind of ties into what I was just saying. I, I really, truly believe after a lot of reflection, again, this stuff is going to change. Every five years, you're going to look back and think, oh, man, I thought I knew something I didn't. So I feel hypocritical even saying this. But what I've discovered up to this point in my life right now is there's two things we need to continue to sharpen throughout our life. And one is our intellect. We do need to get smarter. We need to pay attention and educate ourselves more. But the other thing is we don't realize the power of perspective. And so you can get all the knowledge and intellect you want, but if you're looking at a problem from the wrong perspective, it doesn't matter how smart you got solving that problem from that perspective. Maybe you could just change your perspective and then you're instantly a better um, solution to that problem reveals itself to you. So I think through school and, and academia, we're just taught to solve problems through getting smarter when we don't really have mentors who will tell us like, maybe you're just looking at that the wrong way. You know what? The person in my life who's pointed out to me more than anyone is on this call. It's Nate. You know, he'll be like, I hear what you're saying, Dev, but do you think maybe you're just making an assumption here? And if you looked at it this way, you'd feel differently. And I'm like, yeah, man, <laughs> you're right. You're right. It wasn't a huge problem. It was the way I was looking at the problem. So I'm not saying everything is solved by changing your perspective, but I think we are not taught to pay attention to that. And once you do, you start to come to simpler answers than you thought. Like you don't need to go read 
a 400 page book on business strategy to realize that you're just not calling your customers by name. So they don't feel like, you know, them when they walk in and that's what it is. It's not a strategy thing. It's like, you truly don't know who they are. It's like, Oh, that's just a perspective change. I need to do better at memorizing names. You know, does that all make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And it's, we, we tell ourselves stories and we create these stories in our head that create perspectives. And a lot of times, and, and I know I'm guilty of this myself. I try to go find facts and knowledge to support my current perspective, which is a very laborious process. And sometimes you can do it. In fact, often you can like confirmation bias is a real thing, but oftentimes that doesn't get you closer to the problem than versus looking at it from different perspectives. And, and one thing I'll say that I've always been so grateful about with the people that we've surrounded ourselves with at AFS is that we have enough trust and vulnerability and safety as a group to be able to bring those different perspectives up to one another in a respectful way, because the three of us view the world through quite different lenses. And I think in a lot of environments that could be very detrimental, if not toxic, but we've developed the trust and the vulnerability and the safety to be able to allow each other to point that out to one another. And I think, I think that's so powerful. And to the extent you can create that kind of culture in an organization, that's something that's incredibly powerful. Yeah. And one more thing I'll say on this, not to get too deep, but I think our emotions tell us a lot more about our perspectives than we're ever taught. You know, when you're, when you're angry about something, you know, um, you don't choose to be angry. Like if we got to choose our emotions, we would choose to be happy and blissful and, you know, ecstatic all the time, but we're obviously not, you're not choosing that consciously, those, those emotions and feelings descend upon you. And then in that moment, if it's a negative feeling, like Nate said, pain helps you grow. It's telling you something about how you're perceiving the world in that moment. And the easy example for that is like, let's say a, a cop pulls someone over that's going a hundred down the highway. And they're just, they're pissed. That's reckless driving for sure. They walk up to the window and they realize that there's a pregnant woman in the passenger seat and they're trying to get to the hospital. That's a perspective change where the cop doesn't, doesn't give a ticket and say, you need to slow down. He actually goes, follow me, jumps back in the car, turns the lights and siren on and like escorts them to the hospital. So like, that's just not knowing the situation and a, a simple perspective change is going to change the emotions of that police officer in an instant. And I just don't think we pay close attention to that in our society and culture. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we tend to, especially men, we tend to bury our emotion and, and consider even peering into that realm to be almost a sign of, of weakness. And I think it's that ultimately becomes the weakness. So I think that that's a, a great point. Nate, I, I want to shift to you because you've had a, a similar, but different developmental journey than, than Devin has had. Talk a little bit about your development journey and, and what it's taught you. I get so mesmerized when we get, let Devin go on those things. I'm just I so, I don't know if people are watching the video, but I'm just sitting back smiling. <laughs> I am blissful when I hear him talk about these things because I just don't feel like it's talked about enough. But um, I think I'll tell my little, little snippet of a story from uh, sort of just a painful perspective because I think that's the best, like I said earlier, the best way we learn there's a mistake that I made I want to talk about. And then I want to talk about how I learned to kind of overcome it. And a big mistake that I made in pursuing growth is assigning my identity to the status that I reached as a professional or as a um, person who, who making such this amount of money or who's done this amount of things. Um, that can be really dangerous. So, you know, I don't know uh, how many listeners are super familiar with applied fitness, but um, we, we worked really hard to get our Ann Arbor location up and running, you know, several years ago. And then a few years into that, we opened our Plymouth location, which Devin and I were together for a few years there. And then we opened a Rochester location, which is actually where I came from. Initially, I moved to Ann Arbor to work for AFS and it was my dream to open an AFS in Rochester and to bring AFS to that community. And we realized that dream within like five years, which which was legitimately my goal when I started. I don't I might've even said it when I first uh, went into the interview. I was like, we're going to open one of these in Rochester Hills in five years. So we did that. And um, we had a couple of really great years there, but all kinds of different factors go into this, but we ended up having to close that facility and move to a smaller location. And that um, when, when I had that realization, we had those conversations like, Hey, our, our client base has shrunk this much revenues are looking like this, you know, this, 
this current state of this business right here is failing. You know, that, that was a reality. And I didn't really know what I had done, but I, I had assigned my worth to the outcome that we were creating at that, at that place. And it crushed me. I had a full on anxiety attack. I think the, uh, Jared ended up taking me to the hospital and, you know, it sort of, it was part of a larger set of sort of traumas that I wasn't dealing with properly in my life, but it definitely sent me over the edge there. And so the lesson there is if we can just, you know, be really good. Uh, I, I make videos and stuff. So I'm going to use like a little camera metaphor. Like if we can be really good with that zoom lens and understand how to zoom in and zoom out really, really smoothly. You know, there's all these different games we play in life. And Devin and I talk about this, you know, it's, when I say games we play, I mean, Hey, what, what's the ultimate outcome goal? If it were to be a video game, what are you after? Right? So like many of us were approaching life as all these different levels, right? I want to be X. So we'll just talk about it from a personal training standpoint. I want to get my level one certification. Okay. I want to be the top trainer at this gym. Well, I want to open my own gym. Well, I want to open three gyms. And those things end up being our markers for success. Well, what would happen if we said, I'm actually there, I'm going to play all these other little games and do these transactional things in society. But my main game that I'm going to play for the rest of my life is I'm going to try to optimize myself as a human in every capacity wellness, fitness, my belief set, how hard I work, all these things. My, my sole goal, I'm going to try to get to the very best version of me that provides the most health, wealth, happiness, and enrichment to the people around me as possible. Well, if that's my ultimate goal, I'm going to do all those other things naturally. And I'm not going to be as crushed when one of them doesn't go right. Cause I know it's just a part, it's just an experience along the way of getting me to that ultimate version of myself. And that back to Devin's talk about perspective, that perspective shift for me has been so freeing. And I know you guys could probably even tell like in this past year or so, my posture is starting to change. It's starting to open up again. And all these things with my health, I'm starting to get better and better at. A big part of it is how I look at my life. Hey, you know, the Rochester thing didn't go as we planned. And that was really, really tough. But now I have all this knowledge that I can use to continue on my ascent to whatever that next version of Nate's going to be. And I think if people are out there listening, we find ourselves day to day constantly in those sort of stress loops of this thing that I've tied my identity closely to isn't going the exact way that I want it. And it, and it really, it can kind of tear us apart inside. But if we can just think, no, oh, I'm the main thing I'm worried about is just becoming a better version of myself. Then we can use all that stuff as just practice and almost like um, resistance training for that sort of uh, hypertrophy of the soul, if you will. Wow. Hypertrophy of the soul. That's going to have to make its way on the teaser for this podcast. That's, <laughs> that's Is that your book. That's uh, that could <laughs> be your book, Nate. Hypertrophy of the soul. Wow. It's, it's amazing what comes out when things get flowing. Nate, I appreciate your vulnerability there. You've, you've shared that panic attack story with our entire team here. And I think it's incredibly powerful and it, and I could speak to what you said, maybe even more so than you can, because you know, creating a business, I'm sure there are business owners that are listening to this, that your business, people call your business, your baby. And I don't even feel like that's accurate. I feel like you create a business and it, it's, it is a part of you. It is a part of your soul. And when we were struggling as a business, Devin and Nate will, will both remember this. You know, we were sitting in a, uh, a leadership team retreat uh, and strategy meeting, uh, literally at a conference room that's right across the street from our Plymouth facility. And you know, I ended up breaking down in tears in front of the entire team uh, just because of the anxiety and the pressure that I felt of trying to make AFS as successful as it could be. And, and on reflection, I realized that I was tying my entire worth to the success of the business. And it, there, was, there was no separation in the identities of AFS and of Mike. And I can't help but think how many people that are in our field that are so passionate about this, which is such a, a great thing. Our field, there's one thing that absolutely has never lacked is passion, but there's, there is a downside to that passion. And that's when it, it does allow you to, to eat away at your soul, to, to, Nate, to use Nate's analogy, you know, there's hypertrophy of the soul, but there's also atrophy of the soul, right? And I feel like we've experienced that. And you, know, you, you talked about emotions earlier, Dev, and I think at least for me, and I think for Nate to a degree, and I also think for you, it's when we really listen to our emotions and reflected on them. And in some cases had very 
painful outbursts of emotions that we were finally able to move forward. And I think that that's, that it's, it's so interesting, but I, to go back to something that's important, I think that we've been able to do that here. The, the three of us, as well as the rest of our team has been able to grow because of that, that safety and that vulnerability that we've created as a group. Like I'm, I'm not, a, not a crier. I don't cry in front of many people, but I could cry in front of that group and let my emotions out. And I think you know, we're coming up to time here and I want to make sure we can give people some, some takeaways from this. So, so Dev, let's start with you. If for people that are listening to this and let's, let's distill this down to the most basic level, because ultimately even the managers and the owners and operators that are listening to this, if they go on the right developmental journey, that, that will help their people. What would you say to everyone that's listening to this in terms of something actionable that they can start doing today that can help lead them on a positive path from a developmental perspective? Wow. There's 50 things I could choose from, but I'll pick one that I think is most important. I guess I might steal it from Nate because we talk about this a lot too, but it's, it's having the courage to be 100% honest with yourself. I mean, obviously being honest with everyone around you and the whole world is the ultimate goal to just be able to show who you really are and live comfortably there. But most of us aren't even being honest with ourselves first, you know? And so once you're willing to be honest and listen to that deeper voice, the second thing I would say that you need to understand is in life, anything worth having or working towards is going to require sacrifice. We don't like sacrifice because it's pain up front to get something better in the future. And um, we don't like that. You know, a lot of that's marketing. A lot of that's our culture and all these things. But once you realize, okay, I need to be honest with myself. The next step is understanding the freedom in this is getting to choose your own sacrifices, not making someone else choose those for you. Um, And understanding also, you don't, you get to choose your sacrifice. That's the freedom. You don't get to not make one to get what you want. You know, those are the two things I think we need to understand is like, you know, when that voice is telling me, okay, you got to go to bed earlier because you're waking up tired and you're not serving your clients well in the morning. It's like, well, okay, I'm going to have to sacrifice an hour of my evening, which is spent with someone really important to me. And I'm going to have that conversation about what I need to do to get to bed earlier. I probably should stop eating, you know, two hours before bed so I can sleep a little bit better. You know, you have to make all these micro sacrifices, but um, freedom in life is is really being able to choose those because in a, a society where you don't get to choose those sacrifices, someone is choosing them for you. That's going to lead to depression very, very quickly and, and victimhood. So If you're honest with yourself and you don't play victim to your ego, you can take personal responsibilities for what you reveal to yourself through that truth. And then you get to choose your own sacrifices. I guess that's what I would say is is a takeaway for people. And that's why I always encourage my team to journal because I think a lot of those things reveal themselves by getting it out of your head and writing it on paper so you can actually see how you're thinking and being like, oh, that's something I can actually take action on right there. So that's what I would say. Wow. Well, Nate, you're going to have to somehow figure out a way to follow that one up. What, what would be, what would be your, your unique takeaway uh, for people that are listening? I'm going to supplement it instead because that honesty piece is so important. I want people to, this will be something that I think we can help trigger them, Devin, with your, with your tips. I want people to take a self-assessment and really be keenly interested in the amount of chronic tolerable pain that you are in. Why am I in this chronic tolerable pain? Because I'm unwilling, just like Devin just said, to make these little sacrifices to feel a little bit more pain up front. So start taking those inventories and figuring out where are these different areas in my life where I'm feeling this chronic, just aching, little nagging pain. And basically, Devin and I talk about this a lot. That pain is a door. On the other side of the door is a better version of you open some of those doors before you ever open them, just take, you know, do this assessment. But if you can start opening some of those doors, just what you see on the other side of that is so intoxicating and and revitalizing that naturally from that point forward, you'll never have to listen to a motivational podcast again. (laughs) Wow. Uh, Guys, that's, that, that's great. And I, I think, to tie this into the overall theme of the podcast, when we talk about the wellness paradox being this disconnect between 
medical professionals and fitness and wellness professionals. And, and we want this podcast to help resolve that gap and, and allow fitness and wellness professionals to be part of the healthcare delivery system. And that path is a hard path. In, in last week's episode, we talked about exercise as medicine and the challenging path. If we are going to go on that difficult but incredibly necessary journey as an industry and as professionals, it is going to start with us developing as human beings first. And I hope that this conversation has helped to give you a little bit of perspective on how you can consider doing this. Uh, we certainly don't think we have all the answers. If anything, everything we've learned has been from the pain of, of making mistakes. And we hope that for some of you, we've just made more mistakes over time than you have, and you can learn from ours. Uh, Dev, Nate, I really appreciate you guys joining us for this discussion. I, I feel like we can go on for hours, but we try to be respectful of everybody's time. So uh, thank you both for joining us. Uh, I'm sure that this is a conversation we will pick up at another time very soon. Of course. Thanks, ma'am. It's fun. Thanks for having us. Well, I truly hope you enjoyed that conversation as much as I did. If you found it valuable and insightful, please share with your friends and your colleagues. Those shares really do make a difference for us. Any information we'd like to share from this episode can be found on the show notes page at wellnessparadoxpod.com forward slash episode 15. Please be on the lookout for next week's episode when it drops on Wednesday. And don't forget to subscribe through your favorite podcast platform. Until we chat again, please be well.